It's nice to be back. I hope this is like, for, like riding a bike. And this is my first in-person event since 2019. So with a bit of luck, I haven't forgotten everything. and I don't fall off the stage and like, accidentally delete all my slides or whatever. So hello. Thank you all for coming. This is a late change to the program. Uh, it turns out Richard Campbell did a talk on uh, basically 20 years of history of, of software engineering and his experiences and things. And my talk was going to be exactly the same. So I thought, maybe not do that, maybe change it and do something else. So I'm going to do a talk which I'm really fond of. It's called Building the Millennium Falcon, Lean and Lego Redux. So it's a bit processy. So it's going to be about, um, it's going to be about how a group of people came together to use lean uh, software development or product development processes to build what was at the time the biggest Lego set ever made. And hopefully you'll come away with some insights into why lean product development is so interesting. So we've got an agenda. My clicker works. That's a good start. So the first thing we'll talk about is Lego. We'll also talk about Star Wars because Star Wars is quite important uh, in my life. I actually went to I had a box at the Royal Albert Hall in London, which is like this very famous concert hall, concert hall, and they showed Empire Strikes Back with a full orchestra. It was absolutely amazing. If you ever get a chance to do that, I recommend you doing it. Anyway, Star Wars, just saying. Um, and then something else I'm really, really sort of interested in, which is the concept of flow. So flow efficiency. So how how requirements flow from idea through into production. It's one of the kind of core principles behind microservices, really, and the idea of you know, building products, not, not, not projects and these kinds of things, optimizing for the flow of work and optimizing for scaling teams around flow. So we'll talk about that. But first of all, this is me. Uh, I did some stuff before around uh, microservices, but most recently I've been writing with my colleagues about uh, legacy displacement patterns. So uh, take a look at Martin's site, it's quite interesting. We're trying to build up a repository of, of, of patterns for how you go about taking big old stuff, big mainframes, big core banking platforms, that kind of thing, and break them up and gradually re-implement them, displace the legacy. Uh, so we can have a different conversation other than just will use the strangler fig pattern, which seems to be every single answer when you talk about displacing legacy. So uh, patterns of legacy displacement with my colleagues, Ian and Rob. So first of all, we'll just have a quick recap. Does anyone in the room not know what Lego is? Okay, no hands. There's normally at least one, one person just to annoy me, but no, okay. So everyone knows what Lego is. Full disclosure, I am what is affectionately known as an adult friend of Lego, an AFOL. And if you've come across this, these are essentially the, the giant sets that they sell for hundreds and hundreds of euros. They're targeted basically at me, right? Um, every year I go to Legoland with my son and we come home and my wife just sort of just sighs in disbelief as I've you know, spent 400 euros on a Ghostbusters firehouse that's this big and things. So that's me, I'm an adult friend of Lego. Um, we'll have a quick recap on Star Wars. Has anyone not seen Star Wars? Now, most people, yeah, there you go. There you go. There's the awkward one who has seen Star Wars, but is pretending not to have seen Star Wars. Okay, so this is my brief recap on Star Wars. So episodes one to three, well, to be honest, we don't really talk about one to three. We'll just forget one to three happened at all. Um, but episodes four is quite interesting. Episode four, what happens in episode four? Well, there's a, there's a boy, he realizes he can sort of do magic. Uh, he falls in love with a girl and he sort of sticks into the evil empire, blows up a big space station, kills incidentally tens of thousands of innocent stormtroopers, which is a bit, a bit naughty, really. Um, then, you know, you've got number five, Empire Strikes Back. His boy's friend gets frozen. Uh, he learns how to actually do magic rather than just knowing about magic. Uh, and he finds out his dad is actually the boss of the evil empire, which kind of sucks for him. Uh, episode six, the boy understands he loves the girl as a sister, which is lucky at this point, right? Because it was getting a bit awkward. So it's all right, Princess Leia is his sister, that's fine. Um, boy fights dad, dad fights boy, boy beats dad. Then there's a nice old cackling guy with electricity and so on. Uh, and then there's a party. So that's where we sort of stop with the original canon. Episode seven. So there's a girl who realizes that she can do magic in this one, right? Which is, which is kind of cool. Um, she fall, falls in love with, uh, with another boy 
who's sort of part of the evil empire, but not, sticks it to the evil empire, and then something bad happens to one of the, I think, no spoilers, but something bad happens to one of the earlier characters, one of the earlier heroes. We've got episode eight, uh, the boy's back, except he's really old now. He's got a big beard, he's really grumpy. Uh, he drinks puffin juice, and it's like a weird color. It's very really odd, blah, blah, blah. And then, oh my God, spoilers, Leia, not Leia. Uh, episode nine, wait, what? It's like this, yeah, it just goes on and on and on. Basically, the last three are the same as the second three, and we don't talk about the first three. So there you go, that's that. All clear? Star Wars in a nutshell. Okay, right. So now you know exactly what happens. Sorry for the spoilers. So here's a recap on Lean. This is my definition of Lean. Uh, a way to build the right stuff for the right customers at the right time. Really? That's, that's really how I think about Lean software development, Lean product engineering. Now, witness the firepower of this fully operational conference talk. It was actually in an office, it wasn't a galaxy. So a long time ago, in an office far, far away, I couldn't afford the music. Dan! Lean Lego. Right? This is a, a story of a group of people who came together to build this, this, this box of Lego. So episode four, a new box. So this was the box. If people have come across these big boxes, uh, this is for 16 years and over. Now, these are, these are serious pieces of kit, these things, right? They cost a lot of money, 16 years and over. Um, it's got 300 double-sided pages in the, uh, in the manual. There's, there's a lot of stuff going on with building this. About 5,000 or more pieces. It's been overtaken now by other sets, but still a pretty large Lego set. If you're an adult fan of Lego, this is the stuff you really like, you really get your teeth into this, right? And this is the team, Ooh. that's the team that came together to build it. So the story is, I work for a company called ThoughtWorks, right? So we're a consultancy and consultants, when you're in between projects, you tend to be on the bench. We call it the beach because it sounds a bit nicer. Uh, and there was a time a little while ago where we'd done a bunch of work for Lego. So Lego had asked us to come up to Denmark, put some of my colleagues up in the Legoland Hotel, which is a pretty strange thing to have to do if you're a consultant. You have all these like, kids running around, and then there's you going off to do your software architecture assessments. And as a thank you, as well as paying us, incidentally, they also took my colleagues to the Lego shop in Billund and said, you know, what would you, would you like anything? And my colleagues went, well, I've got one of those, please. So a little while later, this massive Lego set turned up. And there were some of us on the beach uh, coming up to Christmas and we thought, we'll actually tackle this, we'll give this a go. We'll see if, see if we can build it as a sort of side project while we're hanging around. Now I should sort of take a bit of a sort of diversion here because it's not just about Lego, right? I am gonna be talking about uh, software development processes in the context of this, this, this project of building Lego. So I wanna introduce a number of concepts which probably you've come across before, but I'm gonna be referring to them over the course of the rest of this talk. So the first one is, very simple, Kanban board, story wall. You know, if you work on an agile team, we have one of these, we put our stories on there. Uh, they progress from, you know, from, uh, from, uh, from being analyzed through to in production, and that's pretty much what a story wall is. On a story wall, we have these swim lanes. Uh, notice we've got ready for QA and ready for development. These are Q queues, essentially, that's important. We'll come back to that later. And then we have, yeah, these, these swim lanes like ready for development. I'm sure you've come across burn-up charts as well. So this is a mechanism for tracking progress on agile projects with, for agile teams. In four weeks, we tend to use burn up of scope rather than burn down. Scrum tends to do burn down. So you have a total scope and you burn down until it's done. Uh, in our experience, total scope is never fixed. So we tend to burn up so then you can add scope as you go if you need to. The next thing, and this is where it starts to get a little more esoteric with these sort of, uh, these sort of um, project management tools, the thing, something called a cumulative flow diagram or a flow chart or uh, a finger diagram, they're also called. So in CFDs, what you do is you, you don't just plot the total scope that's burning up, you, you plot each of those swim lanes and, and their progress within the swim lanes. And then something that most people should use, but a lot of people don't, so they haven't come across, is this idea of a valley stream map. Might take the temperature. Who uses valley stream maps often? No one in the room apart from Ian in the front. 
So a value stream map, very simply, it looks at any process. It can be any process at all. It could be the process of getting tomatoes from the fields through to a supermarket shelf. It could be the process of getting an idea from uh, the, a business person through into production via all the different stages. And pretty much all you do on a value stream map is you plot the activities that have to occur to progress a work item to the next stage. They're called value-adding activities. And you plot wait times, so how long each item of work has to wait before being acted on. And as you progress from one side of the value stream map to the other, you end up with less of a product, more of a product over there, and hopefully you can sell the thing that pops out, or you can, uh, it's on your website, you can generate revenue from customers or whatever. So in this case, what you can see is, over the course of this, this value stream, we've got three, four and a half, five days of value adding activity. So you can imagine three days of development, one and a half days of testing, half a day of deployment. But in between, you know, in between development and testing, someone had to wait for 10 days. And then in between testing and deployment, it was 30 days. So the overall lead time is 30 plus 10 plus 2, 42, 47 days. Of which there's only a small amount of actual value adding activity occurring. And a lot, of, a lot of the time when we look at software development processes or any form of lean product uh, development, what we're trying to do is identify where the wait times are, where the waste is in the system and the different types of wait time and then acting to reduce those wait times. So an example might be for wait time, you've finished your work, you've committed, pushed into production, but there's a release train that's not going to take off and deploy for 20 days. So you could, you've lost 20 days worth of money you could be earning whilst your requirement is sitting waiting to be deployed. The cost of delay in that case is quite high. Similarly with things like just-in-time delivery to supermarkets. You want to get produce as quickly as you can onto the shelves, minimize the transport time, the wait time between warehousing and shelves so that they can be sold. Super useful tools, these. Something else that uh, a lot of people don't, don't don't use, I think should do more. This is something called a control chart. So as opposed to plotting the cumulative velocity, how many points you're doing cumulatively in a burn up, what you do in this case is you plot it, you just plot the number of points you're doing as a, as a, as a, as a straight number. Uh, and then what you can do is you can understand the variability in how your team is delivering software or delivering anything. So say one week your team is doing 10 points and that's the first one here. The next time it's doing 20 points, then it's doing 15 points. All of these, all of these weeks of work, all these iterations, these sprints, are within the upper and lower control limits of your control chart. What this tells you is as a system, as a whole, your team is operating well within the variability you should expect of the system in which you're working. Right? And then what you do is rather than say, why did you do 10 points this week or nine points this week, what you do is you say, if you're outside the control limits, then you investigate, then you sort of understand what things were blocking the teams in, in order to not to stop them getting stuff done. Incidentally, this is where Six Sigma, the lean methodology comes from, because these control limits are three sigmas either side of the average. So Six Sigma is the, your, your normal variability for any process. Okay, that's enough of that. <laughs> Lecture over, back to, uh, back, to, back to Lego, which is obviously much more fun. Episode five, the Lego strikes back. So we took a look at the set of instructions, right, me and my mates. And of course, what we did is really excited, like, way, just jumped in, just started throwing them everywhere, piling in, Whoa, this is all really cool, look at all this Lego, brilliant. So we, we all piled in, we all got some stuff, and we put it all together. And yes, I did take all these photos uh, myself, as you can tell, because they're terrible, right? And the thing is, it went really, really, really slowly. Right? It took us ages to get anything done as a team of people. It just things took forever. You know, this is our value stream of what was happening, right? We were just taking ages to find stuff for each step in the manual. I and mean, it's like a little bit of less time to put stuff together, but it took us ages to find stuff. It was really, really super annoying. And so that's my first tip, actually. The first tip is any system that you're in, any software development process, any organization, understand the system in which you work. Use some of these tools 
to understand where the blockages are, where you're spending time, where you can maybe optimize a software engineering or other lean product development process. And what we found is we were sort of, all of us, processing, because we were really excited, we were sort of processing work serially. We were all like trying to do one thing, followed by another, and then another thing, followed by another, until we were done. That's my second tip, coming back to the Kanban boards and storyboards. You can use Kanban boards to visualize any form of work. It doesn't have to be software development requirements or user stories. You know, our recruitment team in, in, in ThoughtWorks, we use Kanban boards to model the flow of, our, of, of applicants through the recruitment process. Um, similarly with ops, we use things like, that, things like these value streams and Kanban boards to, 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 to model pretty much all our operational processes. And I know, for example, John Lewis, which is a big company, big super, um, department store in the UK, you know, they use things like value streams to understand how they can more, they can more effectively do things like build new stores or outfit new stores. So you can use these tools pretty much everywhere. They, 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 could, they, are, they are universally applicable. So what was the result of us going slowly? Well, it turns out, um, you know, on our burn up, a bit sucky, we weren't going to finish till the heat death of the universe. Now, bearing in mind, we're on the beach. We've got a limited time, probably a week, week and a half or whatever it is. Heat death of the universe, that's not good. Sad face. Ooh, boo. Episode six, the return of the process Jedis. It turns out there's five of us. We probably had about 100 years of experience in building software using XP and Agile. Um, in ThoughtWorks, we're, we're an Agile shop and have been pretty much since inception. Um, so, you know, things started to happen organically. People started to notice things, make small optimizations. So a funny thing happened. We went from this, where we were, everyone finding something. I need to move closer. Yeah. Stand over here, <laughs> RF. Everyone doing this, followed by everyone putting stuff together, everyone finding stuff, everyone putting stuff together. And we moved on to a different, a different process. We had some people who started looking for things and some people uh, who started assembling things at the same time. We essentially paralyzed uh, the process that we were using. See, you can see we've got people fetching stuff, people putting stuff together. Um, essentially what we did is we identified this constraint. It's taken us a long time to do a thing. So can we start parallelizing these activities? Can we use the understanding of the system in which we're in to optimize, understand the constraint, elevate the constraint um, fundamentally? So that's what we did. We elevated the constraints and we started doing stuff in parallel. That's my third tip, use the theory of constraints. So everyone knows about queuing theory, right? Queuing theory is everyone's favorite topic in, uh, in computer science. We started doing something, another thing that was sort of interesting. We noticed something interesting happening. So we started doing this. So the people finding things started in advance of, what they, of the people putting stuff together. They created this little queue of work. So the people putting stuff together could optimize and go as fast as they, as they could. Whilst the people in, who were finding things used this queuing system to build up uh, stages in advance of them needing to be done. So really what we did is we visualized this queue. We visualized a ready to be built stage. So we have a finding stuff, then we have a ready to be built, and then a building stage. A, a queue, essentially, based on the pages in the manual. And much like you know, in Lean, the folks building stuff, they pulled from the queue and the people finding things pushed into the queue. So this is my next tip. Tip four, identifying queues in your system that can aid in maximizing throughput. How many folks in the room actually visualize queues, as in queues of work, as in do, do, to do doing done, do do uh, ready for dev, in dev, ready for testing, in testing, where all those ready for stages are queues. Does anyone visualize those things? There's some really interesting maths behind queues. The biggest, the biggest control point for any lean process, any process actually that involves queues, is optimizing queue depth, optimizing the amount of stuff that's in a queue. And when you start to understand how much work you've got in a queue and make that work visible, then you can start to really, really optimize. Essentially, it's way better to control 
queue depth, the number of items in a queue, than it is to, to, to optimize for anything else, including capacity, actually. Identifying queues in your system aids in maximizing throughput, maximizing throughput. So here's an example of optimizing for con controlling a queue, not controlling cycle time. So you know, the length of time it's going to take to get a piece of work done. I've got a little graph, pseudo graph. The mathematicians and statisticians don't shout at me, OK? So this is based on lunchtime today. The times may be different. This is based on lunchtime. So as we can see, we've got a graph with time on one side. We've got cumulative numbers of people on, on the y-axis. So at 1 o'clock, lunch is served, right? And then what happens is you've got this blue line, and these are hungry people arriving in the room over there, right? And so you've got a steady state of hungry people. They're just the people who didn't go to the last session. Then the sessions end, and boom, all of a sudden, everyone turns up, right? looking for lunch. But the problem is there's only so much capacity that the lunch tables have to service people who are hungry. So your actually departures from the queue look like this. It's a steady state. Which is fine when the numbers of people arriving equal the number of people leaving, right? So it's all good. But when you get this massive jump, it's like 300 people suddenly d d like decide to uh, arrive at lunch at the same time, you get this issue. The cycle time blows out massively. The length of time it takes me to get my lunch massively increases, right? Now, the thing is, if you were the people running lunch, how would you look to identify bottlenecks, problems? Would you look at how long it took James to get his lunch? Or would you look at how many people are waiting in the queue? And it turns out queue depth is a leading indicator for cycle time. So just by measuring queue depth, by watching queues increase in front of activities, you can predict increases in cycle time later on. So essentially what happens is, you know, at 1.11, or one, whatever it is, 1.11, um, this massive increase happens, but you don't detect it until your cycle time increases at 1.35. But if you just measure queue depth, you detect it at 11 minutes past. And this is the same with what we do in software. If we've got suddenly a massive bunch of requirements coming in, or if you like, if you're in, in, in actual, actual running code, running software, a whole bunch of messages coming in, by monitoring the number of messages, not how long it takes to process the message, the cycle time, um, you can optimize much more, much more quickly. So anyway, we got faster fundamentally by identifying these queues, making sure that we weren't um, putting too much stuff in them. Look, you can tell, this is our burn up chart. We, we, we were sort of heading up there, but now we're sort of getting a bit better. We're in hours, not heat death of the universe. Tip number five, use burn up charts and yesterday's weather to track, to track progress. But we didn't stop there. You might have come across the idea of T-shaping. So the idea that you want breadth and depth. Um, you, you want generalizing specialists in your teams. People who, you know, for me, I'm pretty deep in pretty much just server-side Java. Uh, pretty rubbish in CSS and HTML, but pretty deep in that. And I'm also, you know, pretty broad in things like architecture, enterprise architecture. I can pretend to be a BA for a bit, probably pretend to be a QA for a bit. So you've got breadth, but real depth in one particular thing. And we started to see that happening with the team. So you get this breadth of knowledge and depth of experience. We started to see some people become specialists in putting stuff together. It's quite a complex top, like topological problem, the Millennium Falcon. There's all these like, support structures and stuff. And they start to get really good at understanding where bits should go next. And then you had people who were good at finding stuff because they were, could remember which pieces or where the pieces were. Oh, that, I saw that a minute ago. I'll just go and get it again. So we ended up with these sort of generalizing special specialists in our process. And they noticed this. They noticed a huge amount of variability in how long it took to find any of the pieces in the box. So way back, Lego used to just basically give you bags, completely unsorted, just all the pieces, essentially. So when you're trying to find something, you have to sort through lots and lots and lots and lots of pieces. And that led to this tremendous variability in how long it took to find anything. Because it turns out, like, finding a piece is a function of the size of the thing and, and the number of them in the box, All right? So little things, and there's only a few, when there's only a few of them, they take a lot longer than big things when there's a lot of them, All right? Pretty obvious. 
So we started just-in-time optimizing. We started creating these little, little cups of, of, of the same stuff. I've seen that before, stick it in that cup, seen that before. So then the next time you needed it, you could just go straight to, straight to that, uh, that, that cup and pick out the right piece. And that actually massively reduced the variability in length of time it took to find any of the pieces in the set. So this is another tip. Use control charts. You can identify the variability. And if you've got really, really spiky variability, it's all over the place. You know, your lots of standard deviations are wide, wide. Then you know you can try and understand why you've got that variability in the pro in your process. Work to reduce it. Why is it that sometimes it takes, like, sometimes a user story takes a day. Sometimes it takes three weeks. Why is it that testing sometimes takes a particular length of time? It might take massively more the next time. What is it that you can identify in those processes that will help you optimize to smooth out the variability? Other fun things happening too. That's one of our bugs. We had defects. So we had two types of defects. We had like cosmetic defects where you could carry on because it was just it might look a bit silly later and we could sort of catch up with it. But we tracked them on defect cards. Then we had an and on called. We had a stop the line defect, which is this is a structural defect. Until we find this piece and finish this step, we can't progress any further. So we'd have to pull the cord, stop the line, fix the red build, all the other metaphors. I'll use other words if, you, if I need to. Um, but basically, we had to stop with these defects. And this sh shows that we've you know, it's torn, so we've, we've, we've fixed this defect. And we also had working progress limits. So we limited the number of items coming into the queues, essentially. Uh, in this case, it's showing four. But can anyone, has anyone spotted the natural working progress limit that we've got? Basically, the manual only has so many pages on it, or only so many steps. So the people finding stuff, you only put so many steps in advance before they had to turn the page, therefore scattering all the Lego everywhere. So we had this natural work in progress limit based on the pages, the number of steps on each page of the manual. And if there was a real issue, we all swarmed around bottlenecks. So if there was a, a blockage, once our work in progress limit was reached, we would all help the people putting stuff together catch up by all of us swarming and putting stuff together in the same way that on software development teams, we want to do that uh, with testing. You know, if I'm a developer uh, and I've, uh, the, the, the whip limit for testing is reached, I, I want to help the QAs clear that backlog before picking my work up, uh, before picking any more dev, up, dev work up. It improves the flow, the throughput of the system and that's what we're looking to do, not improve the throughput or the machine cycle time, the technical term from lean, of the individual process step. So limit work in progress and then pull more work from upstream if you are blocked. Time went on, time passed. And you'll be really pleased to know that we finished. We were home. How the pictures. That's what it looks like. It's giant. It's about this big. It's quite a big thing. So, pictures of cats and unicorns are ubiquitous. So, one of our conclusions so far, I've listed a number of sort of techniques that we used, and listed a number of sort of ideas that apply equally to what we were doing here, and that apply to software engineering, apply to lean product development processes of any sort. Actually, I would argue these processes apply to any of these, these techniques, apply to pretty much anything, any process that you can imagine. Pretty much what we do um, is take something that's intangible, ideas generally, and we turn them through a series of information adding steps into something that's more concrete, that's more valuable, until eventually it's deployed somewhere in production and earning money or doing something else, saving lives. But any other process in your organization can be modeled in the same way. Any other process can be modeled using these series of value adding steps, whether it's physical goods, moving from, you know, moving from uh, raw materials through machines, which gradually turn them into widgets, and then which move into other machines, which get more uh, sophisticated widgets until finally you get an end product. Whether it's cars, whether it's just in time supply chains, these processes apply pretty much everywhere. Um, these techniques are useful pretty much everywhere in an organization. Um, one, one, one exercise we quite like to do 
uh, with our clients is um, obviously consultants we try and teach people how to do this stuff not like not do it for them so the way we, we, we teach around lead time and processes and value streams and things is we get people to imagine their journey to work in groups so you're thinking you're at home um, and normally we do it from when you leave the door because it can get a bit awkward if you're doing like showering and all that kind of stuff so you know from when you leave home to when you get into work and the different steps that you have to take to get there you can create a value stream map of those different steps and then you can look at the different wait times so okay I'm having to stand on a platform waiting for a tram waiting for a train or waiting at a bus stop how long do I wait for and how much of that can I optimize uh, to get to work faster you know if I'm in London we obviously we have lots of trains we have tubes you know how often do I have to wait for another train to come before having to get on it because uh, because the trains are full and when you sort of start to think about these processes in this way as I say you can apply them everywhere John Lewis they applied them as I say to um, to to building um, new department stores and they applied them to the process the same department the process of you know creating a little I don't know Levi's concession in a store the same department would do both things they would say okay we need to get a requirement which is to create a Levi's uh, concession in one store in Porto in the store in Porto say um, and that would cost maybe 50,000 pounds and when they modeled their process it would take them you know 10 weeks to actually do that and then when they looked at the process for creating a department store from scratch like you know the kind of you know optimizing you know until they actually hit design it was the same length of time they were doing the same process for building a department store and creating a little Levi's concession but by modeling their process by modeling the system in which they were in they were able to say actually what we'll do if it's a small job like under 50,000 euros we'll divert it through a different process if it's over 50,000 euros we'll go through another one but they couldn't have done that without optimizing and understanding the system that they're in so this first uh, conclusion is around understanding your system use systems thinking tools um, you visualize work using Kanban boards or story walls across the board really well no pun intended there um, but pretty much you know visualization is the key there's a guy called Don Reinertsen who is a fascinating management consultant he's an ex NATO he's an ex I think submarine commander for for the US um, and he's now a management consultant he specializes in lean product development he wrote this brilliant book called principles of product development flow a lot of this is based on it a lot of this thinking is based on it um, and you know his 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 thinking around visualization the thing he points out is the problem with what we do most of us in this room is that we we we're, we're dealing with intangibles with invisible inventory invisible work products now, if you're running a factory right if you're running a factory you you know when things are going badly wrong if a machine is broken stuff piles up in front of it right you get lots of inventory in front of the machine you can see it but with us you can't right unless you visualize it so I say the first step to optimizing any process is understand the system and then start visualizing visualizing the work that's flowing through it the next thing is to this idea of continually identifying constraints so using the theory of constraints TOC hands up who's read the goal many the Phoenix project a couple of people in the room okay so the goal was written by a brilliant thinker Eli Goldratt several decades ago now and it's it's a business parable it's a the story of a, a manager in a in a in a factory who suddenly gets landed with a problem that the factory is going to close and he's going to optimize essentially the, the manufacturing process to save everyone's job Phoenix project which was written a bit later by Gene Kim et al is a retelling of it for what we do the IT world um, and in the goal Eli Goldratt identifies this thing this idea the theory of constraints so in any process there's always a bottleneck and the key thing is to visualize the process visualize the system using things like these these tools identify the bottlenecks and then work to reduce those bottlenecks uh, and then you move on to the next bottleneck because the bottleneck just moves you know once one machine is operating at full capacity uh, there might be it might overload a machine upstream uh, that isn't able to handle it uh, so then you move on to the next bottleneck then the next bottleneck interestingly uh, 
Don Morrison talks about the theory of constraints somewhat dismisses, dismissively, because there's a famous story in, in the goal about one of the characters who's a scout master. And the scout master goes out on his, his walk with the scouts. And one of the scouts is uh, a bit bigger, shall we say. He's carrying too much stuff and is essentially really, really, really slow. Right, super, super slow. So how do you optimize the process of getting from A to B when you've got one person who's super, super slow? So the first thing they did was, ah, oh, they've identified, they identified he's carrying too much stuff. They distributed the stuff to all the other scouts. And then they basically worked out that he couldn't get any faster. So they said, well, uh, if we can't go any faster, we'll just have him at the front and everyone will walk at, the, at, their, at this person's speed and we'll all get there at the same time. Don Ronison points out that you know, that, that's true for machines. You know, machines are uni for a single purpose, right? You can't generally reprogram a machine or like a manufacturing machine to, to, to make lots of different widgets. But people can do lots of different tasks. So his perspective on how you solve the, 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 the scout problem is not to like, everyone walk at the same speed as the slowest person. Everyone operates at the speed of the slowest machine. It's so that people get to do other things. We can swarm, we can go and help our testers out, we can go and help our analysts out, we can go and help our UX folk out. You know, we can do different stuff. In terms of the scout analogy, instead of everyone having to walk behind the scout that was slowest, instead of doing that, you could send some of the more senior folk on in advance and maybe they could get the fire going, get the, I'm British, get the tea brewing, you know, find some firewood, sort the campsite out. You don't have to you know, follow everything according to lean manufacturing. You can optimize for humans as well. So continually identify constraints. Oh, there's a sidebar to this, which is I was on a name drop, sorry. Appeal to authority, I should say, probably. That's the logical fallacy, isn't it? Um, so appeal to authority. Martin Fowler and his wife were staying at my parents' house. Now, that's a random thing for anyone to happen to anyone, right? So Martin Fowler is at my parents' house. And we go for a long hike along the coast in South Wales, where I'm from. And there's quite a big steep hill. And Martin Fowler is a very, he's, he's a very slow walker. He's from, oh, I'm just going to walk along with this. Year. Um, and me and Cindy, his wife, are quite a lot faster. So we sort of start walking up this hill quite quickly. And Martin, while slow, is unstoppable. So he always, he'll always he'll get there, he'll just be slower. And uh, I, I sort of said, oh, we'll just wait for you, Martin, to catch up. And he said, oh, no, no, you go and get to the top and have a snack and oh, well, you know, have a look at the nice view. And he'd actually identified the difference between the manufacturing view of theory of constraints and the product development view of theory of constraints uh, whilst they were at my parents' house. A bit of a random, random anecdote. Anyway, use the theory of constraints. This next thing is about you know, visualization as well, but queues, work in progress, and swarming, they, they really help keep throughput high. And that's what we're optimizing for when we're trying to build software, when we're trying to get stuff onto supermarket shelves. And queues are super important. Visualizing queues, visualizing how much things, how, how many items are in a queue, uh, that, will, that really helps you, uh, that really helps you uh, to manage flow and manage throughput. Um, and then the last thing is this idea of yesterday's weather and burn up. You know, you've probably heard the phrase of yesterday's weather. You know, what's today's weather's like? Well, it's 70% of the time it's going to be the same as yesterday's weather. That's the kind of agile thing with, you know, predicting your velocity, right? You know, how fast am I going to go to this next week? Probably about the same as I went last week, you know. Um, so you can use that and burn up charts to understand when things are going to finish and optimize accordingly. And then finally, you know, use control charts to identify and reduce variability. Now, I did this talk, this bit. It's got to be nine years ago now, first time. Um, there's a new Millennium Falcon out, which is even bigger than this Millennium Falcon. And that's not even the biggest thing they build now. I think the, in, even in the Star Wars range, they've got an ATAT, which is like yay big. Just crazy. It's the biggest box they've ever, they've ever created. So, you know, what's happened? in that intervening decade, which is why this is redux rather than a straight talk. So what happens in 7, 8, and 9? Well, f pretty much they're like 4, 5, and 6, but just newer. Um, so it's more of the same. Except with not, not with Star Wars, with crazy clown people. This is from a different 
Oh. Apologies. This is from a different Lego uh, sort of universe. They're called the Nexo Knights. And when I was putting this talk together, I thought I'd take the opportunity to go out and buy a Lego set on expenses. That's the first time and the last time I'll ever be able to do that and get away with it. But that's what I did. So I went out and bought this Lego set on expenses. This is a smaller one. I didn't want to take the Mickey, right? This is only 9 to 14. Because I was asking myself, I play a lot with Lego with my, with my children. And I asked myself, looking at the changes they'd made. If you were Lego and you were also constantly learning, and they're an amazing learning organization, Lego. If you were learning from the experience of building Lego sets, what would be the changes that you would make that would have the biggest impact on the Lego system of work? Finding pieces, queuing those pieces up, assembling pieces, and so on. From essentially a bunch of raw materials. Is anyone going to have a guess? If anyone's built Lego recently, you'll probably know from, yeah, there's one, someone at the back. They put them in small bags. So the gentleman at the back has said that what they do is instead of having a massive just sack of Lego, they put them in small numbered bags. And so when you start on the, the manual, it says bag one, and it's got all the stuff you need for the first 10 pages. All the, and then bag two for the next 10 pages. Do so you remember this, this big sack of Lego that came with Millennium Falcon and us having to optimize to find these little bits in order to reduce the variability it took to find things. Well, there's another science bit coming up, right? I mentioned queuing. Um, another probably related but the best way essentially to, to, to control throughput or to help with throughput is batch size. So this is from Principles of Product Development Flow. The batch size queuing principle, reducing batch sizes reduces cycle time, full stop. Right. By reducing batch size, when we talk about continuous delivery and continuous integration, when we're de developing software, what we're talking about is reducing the batch size of the work that we're pushing through the software development process. Rather than have 100 items being deployed, or 100 items being developed, or 100 items being tested, we're talking about 10 items or 50 items. We're talking about 10, we're talking about five. And ideally, we're talking about one on-demand, single-piece flow, one requirement passing all the way through the, through the system into production to earn money, save lives, whatever it is. Reducing batch size reduces cycle time. There's maths, turns out. It's one of the most famous formulas in queuing theory. I don't know if anyone knows the most famous formula in queuing theory. Shout it out. No, I'll come to it in a second then. Spoil the surprise. But this, is, this is essentially, you know, if we're talking about requirements, we're talking about time on this side, cumulative quantity of stuff you need to process, all right? Um, and this shaded area is essentially the batch, the batch size. So the quantity is the vertical uh, amount of the y-axis and the length of time it's spending sitting in a queue before earning money, uh, saving whatever it is, is that length of time there. Now, just by reducing batch size, you can, this is Little's formula, Little's law is the most famous one in blah, blah, blah. But just by reducing batch size, you can improve throughput by orders of magnitude without doing anything else. Anything else at all, just by putting smaller batches through your system. You don't need to add more people, right? You don't need to make them work harder. Just reducing batch size gives you this massive increase in throughput. Because if you can see here, the length of time is taken in the queue is a lot smaller there than it is over there. So therefore, anything that's put into production at this point is earning money for the, for the difference, for the delta. Right. Requirements in small batches, or ideally single piece flow, the best way of controlling cycle time. Batch size reductions can enable us to shorten cycle time, often by an order of magnitude or more, without changing capacity utilization, and it's maths, which is nice. You can kind of bet on it. So as I say, this brilliant book, Principles of Product Development Flow, um, it blew my mind. Well, when I first read it, it's very dense, I warn you. It's something like 187 principles, of which those are two, right? Um, it's very dense. When I first read it, I was a little sort of a bit, 
my words. But then 10 years later when I read it, I was a lot more experienced. And it just blew my mind. Totally blew my mind. So I can't recommend this enough. And in this, Don Ronaldson talks about the effects of cues. He says, cues create longer cycle times, or we've seen that. They increase risk, right? So the longer, something, the, longer something, the longer time an item spends in the queue, the more risk there is with product development. You know, the more risk that requirements will change while something is sitting, waiting to get processed. You get more variability for, ver for because reasons. You get more overhead. Bigger queues mean more meetings. You get lower quality and you get less motivated people. You know, if I can see the results of my work tomorrow in the real world, it's more motivating than having to wait six months, 18 months, two years. And there are still a lot of folks out there who do have to wait that long before they can see the results of their hard work. So, round of applause for the, man at the, the gentleman at the back, I think, for pointing this out. Someone was paying attention. This is exactly what LEGO did. They identified the fact that batch size was the the limiting factor in these big sets. Um, and so they reduced the batch sizes and they reduced the variability by putting everything you needed for a smaller bit of work into one bag. They also had been reading more of Don Wynerson's work as well, because there's something that Don talks about called the fluidity principle, right? So if it's possible, to, if it's possible to, to take a big problem and break it up into independent problems that can be, parallel, that can be solved in parallel, and then join together at the end, then again, you get another increase in throughput in your system of work. That's the fluidity principle. And they've even got it in the manuals. This is literally the Lego fluidity principle implementation, where you can build this bit, you can build this bit, two different groups of people can build it, and then plug it together. Now, I'm not gonna say something, something, something microservices, but something, something, something microservices, right? Creating small components or small uh, small, smaller systems that we can plug together, small things that do a Unix principle, small things that do one thing well, and that are uh, linked by uh, universal interface. So it's fluid principle. And that's the, the end result of the next few nights. So, coming up to the end now. In summary, these will be my tips. Ramming the point home, understand your system, understand the system that you're working in, visualize the system that you're working in. Visualize the queues that you have, visualize the inventory that would otherwise be invisible, that wouldn't be invisible in manufacturing. Identify constraints, use the theory of constraints, but recognize its limitations in product development. People can do more than one thing, machines usually can't. Uh, so understand that you can swarm, we can create generalizing specialists and so on. Use whip limits and swarming to keep throughput high and think about small batches. There's a reason we bang on about continuous delivery and continuous integration and small batch sizes. It's because it has a direct economic impact uh, on, 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 on your organizations that's building the software. And embrace anti-fragility. Anti so um, yeah, there's a great book called Anti-Fragile. Uh, which I won't go into. Uh, Russ Miles uh, wrote a book called, I think it's called Anti-Fragile, which is a lot about this as well. So these are the inspiration for this talk. <laughs> these are the books. Uh, Principles of Product Development Flow, Continuous Delivery, uh, Lean Enterprise, Building Microservices at the End. Sam's a good friend of mine. Uh, and I'll leave you with this. Software should be cheap to replace, quick to scale resilient, and should allow you to go as fast as possible what does this fast as possible mean? It means flow, it means throughput. It means using tools to improve our ability to get stuff done, essentially. Um, finally, what would Lego do? Would well, Lego would use small batches. And that's me, thanks very much. Uh, enjoy NDC and uh, I'll take questions. I've got eight minutes or so, thank you. <laughs>